Okay. Scrolling through YouTube, the neuroscience PhD student Patel came across Snowball, the white cockatoo. Here's what you should do when you see a cool bird on the internet. Like and subscribe, and then track down the owner and experiment with the bird. Patel let Snowball dance to 11 different versions of the same tune, Everybody, by the Backstreet Boys. And it turns out that he was on beat 25% of the time, which was definitely no accident. Then, Harvard grad Snaker followed up the research by watching over 5,000 animal videos on YouTube. And it turns out that besides humans, only 14 species of parrots and the Asian elephant was capable of moving to an external beat. So naturally, we ask, why can we dance? And why do we dance? Hey everyone, I'm Julia from Class Neruda. Today, I'm going to talk about why we dance. <laughs> a good AP habit is to start with etymology. The word dance comes from dance up, uh, Oh, French, obviously, which means to move the body rhythmically to music, not very helpful. A better root could be found with the word kinesthetics, which is comprised of the Greek roots kinin, to move, and aesthesis, or perception. So we would generally define dance as to use movement in response to an external rhythm to communicate something. I'm going to arbitrarily. Divide the reasons into three sections. Evolutionary, social, and personal reasons. First body paragraph, let's go. Let's get into how humans evolved into dance. First, some context on evolution. Most anthropologists agree that there are two major leaps in human evolution. One, bipedalism, or walking on two feet, and two, the emergence of language. Sometime after we became bipedal, dance may have emerged as a shortcut for finding better mates. You see on the diagram here, we became bipedal even before we fully became homo sapiens, so possibly dances hold older than humanity itself. And for your information, here are all the different hypotheses on why we ended up bipedal, but luckily we did. Um, so those with the coordination tended to have more symmetrical bodies, um, and it meant that they were less likely to have genetic defects. You see the face here, both the center and right face seem to be more attractive than the left because they are symmetrical. In a 2004 experiment, Brown and researchers uh, got people to dance to a popular song and then let youth record the attractiveness of the performers. To reduce confounding due to appearance, the researchers reduced dancers to stick figures. Women greatly preferred more symmetrical men who moved with more ease. Then the dancers wore calorimeters, and we found out that better dancers actually burned less energy while covering the same ground, literally having more efficient bodies. Here you see the difference is like really statistically significant. Yeah, so dancing could have been a way for humans to find healthier mates and produce offspring, um, making them more likely to survive as individuals and as a species. Up next with the development of language, Kevin Leyland produced the imitation and sequencing hypothesis proposing that dance emerged as a byproduct to language. Language evolves, language involves imitation, which uses an area of the brain called the frontal operculum, shown here. And it helps us remember and reproduce complex sounds, but also movements. Um, so in a tribe, there would probably be like a first dancer, and then other people would imitate them. And gradually, as more and more people inside the tribe learn to dance, we form a virtuous cycle where tribe members could signal that they belonged by dancing. And the more they practice dance, the more tribe belong. The more tribe members wanted to belong. So it made the tribe more productive as a whole. Research 
shows that by moving in unison, humans literally felt the same sensations with each other and empathized on a more fundamental level. Military historian William McNeil hypothesized that prolonged rhythmic movement in a group of people could produce a sense of euphoria, where individuals could no longer distinguish personal and collective happiness. And this was proven in a 2009 experiment. Researchers Wolterman and Heath divided college students into two groups. One was instructed to march around the campus in step, and the control group would walk randomly. And then they asked the students to make trade-offs between themselves and a small group. So what we found out was that the students who marched in rhythm were significantly less selfish. Indeed, you see uh, militaries practice marching to improve solidarity and conformity, despite it being totally useless and counterproductive in battle. By moving in unison, we enter into the same state of mind with our peers, and it blurs our personal boundaries. Think about our morning exercises. Come on, moving on. Thus, the answer genes were more likely to get passed on, better dance learners achieved better status in a tribe, and dancer tribes felt more loyal towards each other and worked harder to survive. So gradually, we evolved into this well-coordinated, rhythm-sensitive species. Next up, let's talk about the role of dance in human societies. Societies are defined as groups of individuals involved in recurring voluntary interactions. Through dance, people share their private emotions with each other and experience a positive feeling. Maypole dancing emerged around 1400 AD in Germanic pagan tribes. A village would erect a maypole um, on May 1st and um, every person danced around the pole. Uh, there was a ribbon, one hand, and tied to a person's hand, and the other end tied to the top of the pole, which symbolized their connection to the village. People could express their happiness at the arrival of the planting season, and they could greet all the villagers that they hadn't been able to meet during the cold winter. But we can also find the case of expressing painful, extreme feelings through dance. In the aftermath of the Black Death, a very strange dance emerged all over Europe, the Danse Macabre. In villages, peasants shown here wore costumes of nobles and knights and skeletons, and they danced around a bonfire, hysterically. Life was anxious through the plague and really confusing because all their prayers went unheard. And dance was entertainment, and it brought laughter that eased people's fright of nearing the end of their short, painful lives. You might have heard this nursery rhyme. Bring around the rosy, pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. There wasn't really any other way for people to express their desperation, so they danced in rapid, powerful steps. Furthermore, dance was a way to preserve one's identity in a community that was under threat. In South America, enslaved people performed high-energy dances from African tribal ones. It was to remember their ethnicity and religion, and to also let out fear of their masters, and to reclaim their freedom in a strange kind of way. Um, in the more restrictive north, uh, slaves performed the cakewalk, as a subtle mockery of the white's ballroom dance, known here. Slave owners thought it was a simple dance for the entertainment, but little did they know. That was a way that they could preserve their own dignity and be on equal status with their white masters. In colonized Brazil, slaves performed the capoeira, a martial arts based dance that was actually combat training for resistance. It's true. The form, or the moves, or the music, or the expression were all a unique product of the social context. But the more fundamental thing is that at the moment, they were free. Finally free inside their bodies, and 
having total strength. Next up, let's talk about the more personal reasons for dance. This personal drive is observed across cultures and time periods. People dance to express their emotions, or perhaps impulses that remain inside their head a little bit confused and don't fully fledge into emotions unless one dances them out. The first thing that came to my mind was contemporary dance in this corner. There is improvisation where the dancer immediately presents new ideas into the performance. Anthropologist Lamont describes the impulse to dance as windows that lead to another world that spontaneously open, and that we should become more sensitive to these bursts of energy. Like, don't let social inhibitions stop you. Claim those moments for yourself, and you only. Next time you see Nelson rolling in the hallways, don't judge him. Going deeper, we see that people dance to transcend. Transcendence is a state of heightened consciousness, where individuals temporarily forget their mundane worries. An example is the practice of mafana in the Tonga community shown here. Um, skilled dancers and singers lead the event. It's really organized, and participants enter into a state of heightened empathy, where they wholeheartedly approve of Tonga values and empathize with the bodies next to them based on shared historical experience. Sounds like yoga, right? And meditation. Well. People sense their inborn potential as individuals, community members, and actors in history when they are fully in contact with their bodies. Nietzsche's ultimate question for life was, does it dance? Whether it be a religion or a philosophical theory, does it bring a joyful affirmation to our earthly existence? He concluded that life did. Well, in the past, dance was a survival mechanism, but now when we hold life in our hands, we dance to enhance it and deepen it. We turn instability and fear into curiosity and freedom. So, go dance, and go live. Thank you.